For 150 years, the American Public Health Association's dedicated public health officials and organizations have worked diligently to create the world's healthiest nation. APHA is the only organization that combines a broad-based member community with the ability to influence policy and improve the public's health. From the beautiful city of Boston, this is the 2022 APHA Annual Meeting and Expo, and this is APHA TV. Hello and welcome back to this thrilling third day of APHA TV. At this annual meeting, we strengthen the profession of public health, share the latest research and information, promote best practices, and advocate for public health issues and policies grounded in research. Today, we focus on the recent Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and what that might mean for the future of public health. We sit down with keynote speaker and reproductive justice advocate Loretta Ross, what she has to say about the future of being female. And our tour across the country continues today as it takes us to organizations focusing specifically on sexual health, reproductive rights, and maternal safety in the healthcare system. We start off today's focus on reproductive health in Salt Lake City, where the University of Utah's Ascent Center is elevating sexual and reproductive health to a new level. This team of researchers is doing so by focusing on expanding and improving local contraceptive access and sexual and reproductive health equity. Let's see how. Access to contraception has an enormous impact on an individual's ability to live the life that they want. Reproductive autonomy is a fundamental human right. And what we've seen in the research that we've done is that people who can get the methods that they want are better able to use them, um, tend to have fewer unintended pregnancies, and are able to get the education and pursue the careers that they want to have. The Ascent Center played a role in expanding access to contraceptive care in Utah through a number of different initiatives that we've been doing for the last several years. Some of the novel methods that we've been able to explore at the university have really uh, broadened our understanding of contraception and um, allowed participants to experience new methods. We're so focused on the ability of the findings to really drive care forward in the future. We're in the middle of a black maternal health crisis. We know that black women are three to four times more likely to die than their white counterparts. We know that 80% of maternal deaths are preventable. The center's addressing maternal health inequities through various events such as conferences, community outreach and support. When we consider the center's role in addressing inequities within the community, it is our being clear about the historical role of institutional racism in policies and practices relating to the health and welfare of black women and birthing people. So the vision of the Center for Black Maternal Health and Reproductive Justice is to protect the black birthing experience by ensuring that all black birthing people have equitable and respectful processes in maternity care. My hopes and the dreams for this center are that we continually bring awareness about black and brown moms that face maternity health inequities. After the Supreme Court voted to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade decision, the resulting reproductive freedom landscape became very complex. Here in studio with us to navigate what this historic decision means about the future of being female and reproductive health is activist and advocate Loretta Ross. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for having me. Let's get started with defining what is reproductive justice. Well, reproductive justice was a concept 12 black women created in Chicago in June of 1994, because we were impatient with the pro-choice, pro-life binary that failed to adequately express what we needed from reproductive politics. So basically, we joined with the pro-choice movement in fighting for the right not to have a child. And so that includes support for abortion, birth control, and abstinence, if you can hold on, I mean. 
abstinence, right? <laughs> anyway, but because we were black women, always subjected to thinking that we have too many babies, we have to fight for the right to have the children that we want to have and the conditions under which we want to have them. So that means refusing an unnecessary C-section or having your birth plan respected when you go to the hospital or using a midwife or a doula if you prefer. And then the third tenet is the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments because neither the pro-choice nor the pro-life movement focuses on what happens when the baby is here. And so the right to have a child, not to have a child, and to raise your children are the three core tenets of reproductive justice. All right, let's pivot a little bit and talk about what is reproductive futurism. Well, reproductive futurism is a concept I've been thinking about. I didn't coin the term reproductive futurism. <laughs> that actually was coined by the LGBTQ movement. But I'm applying it to use the lens of reproductive justice to really criticize if they were at least examine this techno utopia that all the people who are promoting all of these unfounded promises of what technical adva advancements are going to do mm -hmm. to the human species, mm -hmm. they really need to be examined because first of all, all of our technology, like social media, may be used to upgrade present day inequalities because we have not addressed the underlying causes of misogyny and racism and homophobia and transphobia. And so we'll just have better means of implementing the same old ideas if we don't pay attention. But also, techno-utopia overpromises. They convince women, for example, to pay $20,000 for an IVF treatment without telling them that only 13% of stored eggs ever result in successful pregnancies. So you've got an 87% failure rate for something you just spent $20,000 a try on. And many people have to try multiple times mm -hmm. because it's not just one time, you gotta do it multiple times. And they're not telling people the medical risk of egg harvesting and... The cancer concerns down right. the road. They're not mm -hmm. telling. There's no full medical disclosure required of them, so they're not doing it. And so I am concerned that unrestricted reproductive technology that doesn't have moral boundaries or guidelines will end up exploiting vulnerable and desperate people who want to express their right to parent in the way that they want to and can be easily manipulated and suffer me mental health damages because of it. Loretta, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for interviewing me. Bye-bye. Cherished Futures for Black Moms and Babies is a joint initiative to reduce black maternal and infant health inequities and improve the black patient experience in Los Angeles County. Grounded in data and black women's experiences, Cherished Futures brings together decision makers from local hospitals, public health departments, health plans, and black community leaders. Cherish Features for Black Moms and Babies is a multi-sector collaborative initiative and we bring together hospitals and health systems, public health departments, insurance payers, and Black women community leaders to look at how we create systems level change to address the inequities that Black moms and babies and families face uh, here in Los Angeles and collectively that we see across, across the nation. The goal in Cherish Futures is to not only improve the clinical outcomes for black birthing families, but also to improve their patient experience. And we do this um, by looking at institutional opportunities for change within our hospital system. Research has made it very clear that at the root of these inequities is racism. The impact of racism on black bodies is not only harmful, but it's measurable. And so we wanted to make sure that we designed an initiative that would address, again, not changing the behaviors of black birthing people and families, but really changing the behaviors of the system.
so much specially curated content to cover and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode on the TV monitors throughout the convention center, on the in-house TV channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website, and of course, on our YouTube and Twitter feeds. How will the public's health be impacted by the recent opinions and actions of the High Court? And what are some upcoming cases to look out for? Sarah Rosenbaum, Professor of Law and Policy at George Washington's Institute of Public Health, dissects what happens and what happens next. For the past 60 or 70 years, the whole approach toward agencies, particularly scientific agencies that are charged with the power of protecting population health, CDC, EPA, uh, Interior, organizations like this, agencies like this, um, are have been understood as having very broad powers. Congress would write legislation to give them a broad grant of authority and let them then bring the best science to decision making. Um, with a lot of deference from the courts, uh, at least where the agencies had gone through a reasoned rulemaking process. All of a sudden now the court has reversed course and basically has said that unless agencies have very, very specific, problem-specific directives from Congress to step in and address a problem, um, it will consider their actions outside the bounds of what would be legal. And the problem with that, particularly for the scientific agencies, is that the reason Congress sets up a broad grant of authority is precisely because lawmakers can't predict in 1970 what the problems are going to be in 2023. Uh, and uh, if, if an agency has to go back each time to Congress to sort of ask a mother may I um, uh, with very, very specific instructions. That means that the agencies cannot respond to emerging critical problems as they occur. Congress is very slow and has no experience drafting particular legislation. So it's essentially a deregulation activity meant to freeze agencies uh, as opposed to empower Congress. Only last week, the court heard arguments on the affirmative action uh, policies that have been in place for 50 years now, uh, and will decide probably during this term whether or not to allow universities and by definition, therefore, a lot of other private and public sector entities to be conscious about race as one of the many, many factors they use um, in selecting candidates. Um, and this could be a very serious problem, obviously for diversity at universities. Um, that's a case that everybody's watching in public health, especially because of the implications for the health professions, um, which are, have uh, health profession schools have put such emphasis on a diverse workforce that this could really harm things. Um, a second uh, case, which is gonna be argued tomorrow, involves whether or not Medicaid beneficiaries, so there are 88 million Medicaid beneficiaries now, Medicaid beneficiaries can protect their rights in court when state officials act in ways to curtail uh, their, act, uh, their rights. So for example, a state deciding totally unlawfully to suspend enrollment, to not take any new applications, or to cut entire benefits out of the program that are required benefits. These are rights in Medicaid, the right to apply, the right to coverage if you're found eligible, the right to certain benefits. Um, and one of the things that's kept Medicaid the strong program that it is, is that beneficiaries, like other insured people, have had a right to go to court if somebody threatens those rights, which means the state officials, you know, have towed the line on the, on the law. The court is poised now to take the right of access to the courts away, leaving almost 90 million people with no way to enforce their insurance protections. Um, it also would, would ultimately and completely change programs like SNAP, child welfare, 
other big federal programs that are administered by states. The Grassroots Maternal and Child Health Initiative demonstrates how impactful it can be to learn from women who live in marginalized communities. By learning about the social systems at the heart of poor maternal and child health outcomes, we can implement systems that improve care and nurturing for women, children, and their families. The Grassroots Maternal and Child Health Initiative is grounded in our grassroots maternal and child health leaders. We go out into neighborhoods with poor maternal and child health outcomes, and we recruit women from those neighborhoods to become leaders. The Grassroots Maternal and Child Health Initiative aims to build the capacity of women and organizations in traditionally marginalized communities to bring about systems change to improve maternal and child health outcomes in their communities. These women, um, during this training and what Jack did, he gave them such an empowering mindset. This mindset has carried over for these women um, and how they interact in their community, in their careers. They've advanced so far. Um, it personally touches my heart to see how they've grown. They went from not knowing how effective their voice was to making sure that their voice was heard and creating change with that. Keeping our focus now on the health and care of black mothers and babies, the Center for Maternal Health Equity, run by the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, is committed to nurturing healthier mothers, healthier children, and healthier families. Let's see how they are doing so by advancing the science of women's health and building stronger community engagement. The Center for Maternal Health Equity at Morehouse School of Medicine was founded in direct response to the inequities that we saw in maternal mortality and maternal morbidity rates in the state of Georgia. Black women and indigenous women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. A lot of times we focus on the maternal mortality issue, um, but we don't put enough attention on those individuals who survived. We think it's critically important that we hear the voices and uplift the voices of black women when doing research. We see a partnership with a community-based organization, not as a top-down approach, but an equitable partnership where together we come up with solutions and act on those solutions. In 2022, no woman should die from pregnancy-related complications, especially on a day that's supposed to be the most wonderful day of this person's life. Well, from SARS to COVID-19, there have been no shortage of public health emergencies over the last several years. But how should we respond to those public health emergencies from a legal perspective? Joining me now here in studio is Georgetown University Professor Larry Gostin, hopefully to answer that exact question. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Let's go back a little bit and start off with public health law and ethics and how that came into existence in the first place. Yeah, let's start with ethics. You know, we... You know, we have a history in America of focusing on the common good, what we owe to each other. And we've seen that right through our history when we would, with smallpox vaccinations um, through to um, save food and clean water. Um, and we have this rich tradition that went through JFK, you know, ask not what uh, you, know, you can do for your country. Exactly. Yes. And then we, the, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Great Society, the War on Poverty. Um, and yet today, we've lost that tradition of the common good and we're all, all about what, what are my rights? Me, me, me. Uh, me, and not what, what do I owe to my family, to my country, my community, to my world. And the law has reflected that, um, whereby originally we had had a huge understanding in the judiciary of the need for strong public health powers. And fast forward to the current Supreme Court, that is just eviscerating our ability to protect health, safety, the environment, um, and even 
you know, issues like reproductive health and abortion. Right. Were you surprised by the Supreme Court's decision regarding Roe v. Wade, the fact that they waded into that in the first place? Well, you know, uh, the very sad truth is with this empowered, super conservative majority, um, their, predict their, their decisions are almost predictable. And they've really decided to own all of the most contentious issues in America. If you think about it, abortion, race, climate change, firearms, the list goes on and on and on. And they really are, you know, destroying what we are as a nation, you know, about the idea that we, we're in this together and we've got, we need to protect one another. We need to look out for one another. The court doesn't seem to get that. Obviously, that decision by the high court had a, a huge impact on public health. Are there any other cases that stick out to you with regard to having a large public health impact? I would name a few. I mean, certainly firearms. Um, you know, we have you know, tens of thousands of people dying of firearms every year in the United States more. Um, and for most of our nation's history, um, we didn't regard the Second Amendment as something that applied to an individual right. And now um, the court is really diminished, if not destroyed, um, our ability to, to enact sensible firearm safety. I would also, on issues of public health and climate change, um, really saying that um, public health agencies, particularly federal agencies like OSHA, EPA, CDC, um, don't have those kinds of powers. And, and, the, and the upcoming term, I think, on the, on the ballot is affirmative action. Um, and it's not just college admissions. It also is about, you know, our ability to take race into account in, in, in vaccination allocation and other kind of measures of equity. So we're really threatened by this current Supreme Court, in my view. Larry, I could have talked to you all day long, but <laughs> we do you. have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time today. I sure do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Turning now to the attendees, and we pose the question, how can the APHA help us overcome social and ethical challenges? Well, the social and ethical challenges out there are great right now. Um, one of them is certainly racism, there's inequity, there's poverty, and the, there's a lack of technical expertise not knowing what to do to protect public health. Um, right now, I feel the biggest one should be um, reproductive rights, you know, um, especially for Presently, women should have the right to make decisions in anything concerning um, childbirth and all. Um, public health is all about, uh, all about awareness creating, so they should create more awareness so that people will know this is it. They should know their rights at all times. They shouldn't be intimidated and all. So I think that's the basic one, creating awareness. One of the problems I think a PHA can help with is um, the human rights to reproductive health for women, especially sexual and reproductive health. I think it's like a really a big deal. So I feel it's something that maybe with APHA public health, we can make more awareness to let them know that abortion is not just all about taking a life. It's also about your own personal decision, your health. Probably the biggest and, and the one that is most important to me is the maternal morbidity of African-American women and people of color. You know, absolutely ridiculous that we have so many women that lose their life during childbirth or immediately following. I think that we have to, as a society, become more unbiased in the delivery of care. We have to listen to women. Um, they know their bodies. Um, Serena Williams, prime example, you know, spoke out, said something's not right. I think I may have a clot. Nobody paid attention until she continued to elevate her voice. And if a well-respected and known name as Serena can't get the care that is needed with the first conversation, then what does the, the normal person experience? And I think that 
This is an opportunity for public health to speak out on the importance of ensuring that care is unbiased across the board. Police reform, I think that's the major problem that is still is, exists in the U.S. And based on my current research, there are two types of the states. Some states didn't pass any legislation recently after the death of, death of George Floyd. So there is, a, there is a real concern here that they need more attention with APHA. They, have a, they had a very good session to talk about this, but there's the area need more, they need more work, and it's, it cannot be done with one or two sessions. This is the continuous work, and we need to keep going forward for this. Social determinants play a huge role in the overall health of the general public. Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Dr. Paul Reed, discusses the initiative Healthy People 2030. Thanks for your time this morning. It is my pleasure to be here. Let's talk a little bit about what you feel are some of the most pressing public health issues at the moment and how your office is working to tackle those. Well, frankly, I think it's what it's always been or has been for many decades now, and that is the burden of chronic disease we know in this country. Uh, I know that sounds strange at a time of a pandemic, um, at a time when substance use disorder and overdoses are at a peak, um, and many other public health related issues are ongoing. But if you really take it in total, um, if you really look hard at the data that, you know, in terms of where the greatest burden of diseases in terms of morbidity, illness, hospitalization rates, as well as deaths in this country, it undoubtedly has to we can't avoid talking about chronic disease. You know, the theme of this year's annual meeting is leading the path toward equity. What has your office done to try to create a healthier nation, leading the path toward health equity, and also addressing some of those health disparities? For our office in particular, health equity permeates everything we do, um, from the physical activity guidelines for Americans to the dietary guidelines for Americans, and of course, healthy people. Um, healthy people in its 40 year plus legacy um, has incorporated elements of health equity um, each and every decade. This decade, far more so than ever before. Um, and that's particularly borne out in the way the social determinants of health are reflected in the work that's um, presented in healthy people. The objectives, the data, the resources tied to them, et cetera. What are some of the efforts that we can look forward to seeing your office um, you know, lead in the next few years? So uh, we're in this, this five-year cycle of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, our office leads. We co-lead it with the USDA, but we have uh, the predominant role to play in, in administering that, and that includes the Scientific Advisory Committee, which is currently being seated. Um, and we're just starting off the scientific review process coming into FY or calendar year 23. That's a good example. In terms of Healthy People 2030 in particular, we're going to be advancing the data that is incorporated into it. We're going to be um, adding two objectives as um, the work groups and the public deem appropriate. We're actually currently going through a public comment period on a new objective related to uh, voting participation as an indicator for health. Um, that's another very um, prominent public health issue these days, um, civic participation. You mentioned how broad the social determinants of health are. Can we narrow that down a little bit? If, is there a way that you can list maybe some of the social determinants that we need to work on to eliminate so that we can try to eliminate health disparities? Sure. Well, so the social determinants health framework it has five major components to it. Um, one example would be healthcare quality and access. That's one that we think about a lot. And in fact, if you look at it, it, our healthcare system as a whole, it's the lion's share of the focus that um, we pay to social determinants. It's really on accessing healthcare properly. I would argue strongly that that's probably the least of the five that we ought to be paying most attention to. We ought to be looking at housing. We ought to be looking at education. We ought to be directing our attention to where people live, learn, work, play, worship, and age, like we like to say. Awesome. All right, Dr. Paul Reed, thank you so much for all that you do, and thank you for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that brings us to a close for day three of APHA TV. There is still much more to come this week at the 2022 APHA Annual Meeting and Expo, and you can count on APHA TV to cover it all. Remember, there are plenty of ways to watch the very latest from APHA TV. So much specially curated content to cover, and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode on the TV monitors throughout the convention center, 
on the in-house TV channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website, and of course, on our YouTube and Twitter feeds. Thanks again for spending your time with us here on this exciting day from Boston. We will see you right back here tomorrow for our fourth and final day of APHA TV. See you then. <laughs>